Letter 2. My dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that your patient has become a Christian. Do not indulge the hope that you will escape the usual penalties. Indeed, in your better moments, I trust you would hardly even wish to do so. In the meantime, we must make the best of the situation. There is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief sojourn in the enemy's camp and are now with us. All the habits of the patient, both mental and bodily, are still in our favour. One of our great allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patience sees is the half-finished sham Gothic erection on the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer with rather an oily expression on his face, bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. When he gets to his pew and looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbours whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbours. Make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people that next pew really contains. You may know one of them to be a great warrior on the enemy's side. No matter. Your patient, thanks to our father below, is a fool. Provided that any of those neighbours sing out of tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. At his present stage, you see, he has an idea of Christians in his mind, which he supposes to be spiritual, but which, in fact, is largely pictorial. His mind is full of togas and sandals and armors and bare legs, and the mere fact that the other people in church wear modern clothes is a real, though of course an unconscious, difficulty to him. Never let it come to the surface. Never let him ask what he expected them to look like. Keep everything hazy in his mind now, and you will have all eternity wherein to amuse yourself by producing in him the peculiar kind of clarity which hell affords. Work hard, then, on the disappointment or anticlimax which is certainly coming to the patient during his first few weeks as a churchman. The enemy allows this disappointment to occur on the threshold of every human endeavour. It occurs when the boy who has been enchanted in the nursery by stories from the Odyssey buckles down to really learning Greek. It occurs when lovers have got married and begin the real task of learning to live together. In every department of life, it marks the transition from dreaming aspiration to laborious doing. The enemy takes this risk because he has a curious fantasy of making all these disgusting little human vermin into what he calls his free lovers and servants. Sons is the word he uses, with his inveterate love of degrading the whole spiritual world by unnatural liaisons with the two-legged animals. Desiring their freedom, he therefore refuses to carry them, by their mere affections and habits, to any of the girls which he sets before them. He leaves them to do it on their own. And there lies our opportunity. But also, remember, there lies our danger. If once they get through this initial dryness successfully, they become much less dependent on emotion and therefore much harder to tempt. I have been writing hitherto on the assumption that the people in the next pew afford no rational ground for disappointment. Of course, if they do, if the patient knows that the woman with the absurd hat is a fanatical bridge player, or the man with squeaky boots a miser and an extortioner, then your task is so much the easier. All you then have to do is to keep out of his mind the question, 
if I, being what I am, can consider that I am in some sense a Christian, why should the different vices of those people in the next pew prove that their religion is mere hypocrisy and convention? You may ask whether it is possible to keep such an obvious thought from occurring even to a human mind. It is, Wormwood, it is. Handle him properly, and it simply won't come into his head. He has not been anything like long enough with the enemy to have any real humility yet. What he says, even on his knees about his own sinfulness, is all parrot talk. At bottom, he still believes he has run up a very favourable credit balance in the enemy's ledger by allowing himself to be converted, and thinks that he is showing great humility and condescension in going to church with these smug, commonplace neighbours at all. Keep him in that state of mind as long as you can. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. <laughs>